Hello, this is Brian. And this is Kathy, and we're from Baker, Baker Bees. In Pride, Louisiana. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Better Bee, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Becky Masterman. Today's episode is brought to you by the Bee Nutrition Superheroes at Global Patties. Family operated and buzzing with passion, Global Patties crafts protein packed patties that'll turn your hives into powerhouse production. Picture this strong colonies, booming brood, and honey flowing like a sweet river. It's super protein for your bees, and they love it. Check out their buffet of patties, tailor-made, for your bees in your specific area. Head over to www.globalpatties.com and give your bees the nutrition they deserve. Hey, a quick shout-out to all of our sponsors who support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on the website. There, you can read up on all of our guests, read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 250 past episodes, read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each episode, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Thank you, Brian and Kathy from Baker Bees. They're in Louisiana. Pride, Louisiana. Pride, Louisiana. Fantastic. I remember meeting them at the Nobby show. Great opening. And Becky, for the next couple of weeks, we do have many guests that stop by at our booth in Louisville at the North American Honeybee Expo to talk to us. So look forward to that. I can't wait. I love hearing every every opening that the listeners do for us. And so since you're not sharing them with me ahead of time, I'm just going to be in anticipation for the next one. I like being like Santa Claus, surprising everyone. Is there a Minnesota in the group, Jeff? There's no Minnesota in the group. <laughs> I will tell you that right now. <laughs> well, you could have just teased me a little bit. <laughs> Come on, Minnesota. <laughs> you know, maybe someone from Minnesota will will jump up and contribute here. Well, we do have a very busy month. Finally through January is a long month. Always is. This month, people are starting to think about bees. I know people are combing through the catalog. I'm sure they've got their Better Bee catalog out. They're buying stuff from Better Bee. Marking their their new technology that they need, or maybe they're like new deeps because they're going to get more colonies this year. Honey supers, thinking ahead, planning ahead. There you go. Or they're taking classes because tis the season to learn how to become a beekeeper. Check out your local club, your association. There's online courses, better be a course. It's a busy month. People are starting to think about that. So do check out our, our sponsors. Buy books. Buy books from Northern Bee Books. So Northern Bee Books, if you want to learn how to make more honey, if you want to learn how to fight Varroa, search their site because you're going to find lots of opportunities to become a better beekeeper. Also, we have strong microbials. You want to get your bees gut healthy with the probiotics and uh, global patties. Stop by the sponsors, let them know you listen, and buy their products. But enough for the unpaid advertisement there, Becky. <laughs> we- <laughs> I was going to launch into bee nutrition, but I'll stop (laughs) right there. (laughs) Hey, can we advertise what we're doing as far as instruction? Do we have to pay for our our own plug? (laughs) We're we're paying for it. Believe me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm excited because we've been working hard at putting together a new, I guess, series of getting started in bees to go with the old series. And we've been putting together some great information for brand new beekeepers and also beekeepers who want a refresher or to get some good ideas. It is an exciting series we're building back in what I believe 2020 when Kim, Jim and I did the original How to Get Started series. We couldn't cover everything we really wanted to And so we're just updating and adding to that content. We're not replacing it. This is just additional chapters in that book of information. It's been fun to prepare. It's exciting. Yes. So I think that listeners are going to be happy to listen, to share, and further their beekeeping talents by 
downloading the episodes as soon as they're ready. How many more weeks do we have, Jeff? They start releasing on February 19th would be How to Get Started Part 1A. I'm not sure how we're going to name them, but it's the the second part one. And then the 26th, and then we move into March, the first two Mondays in March, which are the 4th and the 11th, if I have the dates right. So it's going to be a fun series. We hope our listeners enjoy it. Also wanted to mention that later in April, April 13th, Kathy Summers is holding a memorial for Kim Flodham in Medina, Ohio. So if anybody wants to participate or attend Kim's memorial, you can find additional information on our website and that link will be in the show notes. Today, we have another agenda item and that's that we get to talk about drones with Dr. Brock Harper from Purdue. Are you all set for all your drone questions? I am. You know, drones are so maligned in the bee world. If we were to have the cartoonist draw us a picture of a drone, he'd probably be standing there with his legs crossed, leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette. He would for sure be smoking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and he'd have a drink in his hand, too. <laughs> yeah, and one <laughs> of them. A big old drink of nectar. <laughs> yeah, in one of his hands. And asking for more from a passing worker bee. So they're finding in the research that that's not quite correct, that they're very important for the homeostasis of the healthy colonies that have the right number of drones in the colony. So I'm looking forward to talking to Brock, find out what he's finding out. Yeah, I'm a little worried because every time I give a talk, if I talk about drones, I have a couple of really good jokes I get to tell. They're so much fun <laughs> to make fun of. And so I might have to change my talks and, and give them a little bit more respect than what I am currently delivering. Are these jokes for prime time? Are they podcast jokes? Well, it's nice to have my slide deck up because it's part of the delivery. So you kind of have to see it. It's a different medium. Understood. But yes, prime time. I, I haven't, I've yet to be banned by a club because of <laughs> inappropriate talk of drones. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we'll be hearing from Brock in just a few moments. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Strong Microbials presents an exciting new product, Superfuel the probiotic fondant that serves as nectar on demand for our honeybees. Superfuel is powered by three remarkable bacteria known as bacilli, supporting bees in breaking down complex substances for easy digestion and nutrient absorption. This special energy source provides all the essential amino acids, nutrients, polyphenols, and bioflavonoids, just like natural flower nectar. Vital for the bee's nutrition and overall health, Superfuel is the optimal feed for dearth periods, overwinter survival, or whenever supplemental feeding is needed. The big plus is the patties do not get hive beetle larvae, so it offers all bioavailable nutrients without any waste. Visit strongmicrobials.com now to discover more about Superfuel and get your probiotic fondant today. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, the regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Sitting across this virtual Beekeeping Today podcast table is Dr. Brock Harper. Brock manages the Harper Lab there at Purdue University. (laughs) This has been a rough start, Brock. Thank you for joining us on Beekeeping Today podcast. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Brock. We're so happy you joined us. You're out there in Indiana managing the Bee Lab. You're doing a lot of work. Before we get into everything you're doing, can you give us a little bit about your background, your your beginning story, if you will, of how you got started with bees and ended up here? I've been here at Purdue for five years in my role as an assistant professor. But I, before that, was in Canada. I was in Toronto for about... 10 years. And then before that, Northern British Columbia, a small town called Prince George, smallish town, I guess. And that's where I started really getting into bees. <laughs> I was a very bookish kid. I liked to read, but I also liked to hike. And there wasn't much more to do in the town that I grew up in. So that worked out very nicely for me. And I really liked biology. So, and it turned out I was pretty good at it because I just liked reading and hiking and looking at things outside. So I was told when I was young that if you like biology, you should become a medical doctor. So I 
went down the road of becoming a medical doctor. I was pre-med. I you know, grades were pretty good, but I really just didn't like. I hope none of them are listening to this. I don't. I didn't like the people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if you're one of the people listening, but no, uh, <laughs> I just I didn't enjoy. I, I I wanted to go on hikes and look at things in the woods and talk about evolution and genetics and and everyone else was kind of more interested in like in grades and stuff and that that wasn't me so i was having a bit of a panic like thinking what i wanted to do and 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 someone took me out beekeeping a very close friend named jerry bomford took me out beekeeping and i instantly fell in love as soon as i not with him uh with the bees (laughs) he opened up the, the my first colony and i just remember just a cacophony of sound and smell and and everything and in fact, I, I, every time I now smell cigarette smoke and honey together, I think of that day because Jerry was one who used cigarette smoke as his, <laughs> as his smoker. <laughs> but it stuck with me. And, and I, I kind of just always remembered that moment and thought, well, maybe, maybe if I'm lucky, I can, this can be a career in biology in some sense. So I switched from pre-medicine to biology with not really much of an idea in mind other than I liked bees and I, after that, I worked in, I mean, I, I was a beekeeper during that time. Jerry trained me. I, I, he taught me everything I know. So I've been a beekeeper since, well, I won't say the year, but since uh, a long time ago when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> and I kept up with it. I kept pushing into research. I did, I worked in a cancer lab for a little bit. I worked in an art, in a genetics lab and I worked in an ant lab and eventually I landed as a PhD student in Toronto where I I started doing some work on evolutionary biology and honeybees all the while being a beekeeper but that's kind of how I I got into it so a failed medical student became a bee obsessed person and here I am (laughs) well that's great you know I will not be able to think of anything else today other than Chesterfield infused honey. <laughs> it's a really unique smell and it doesn't happen very often. Not a lot of people smoke anymore and I don't see beekeepers using cigarette smoke as <laughs> as uh, as their smoker but when I get those two together it's very it's very special. So what is the Harper Lab doing? What's the main focus there? I am a trained evolutionary biologist, which means I'm interested in what makes different populations or different species different from each other, and whether or not those differences are the result of uh, selection or, or drift, which is all kind of, I guess, technical, but I apply that to honeybees. So I'm very interested in understanding why different populations of bees might produce more honey, be more defensive, have a different color than each other. And how genetics contributes to that, how and if genetics contributes to that. So that's the primary focus of our lab. We are, I train my students to be, to think like evolutionary biologists. And we do quite a lot of, we really do a lot of techniques now. We've kind of expanded a lot, but primarily our main tool is genetics. You're looking at honeybees, but before we get more into the honeybees, you're also looking at a lot of other different organisms. And so anything that has social behavior, that's an insect, it looks like it has sparked your interest too. Yeah, we study a few others. Honeybees are are still my primary love, but there are some cases where other social insects or social species are doing things that are just fun to, to look at or to consider. And some cases where those social insects could impact honeybees. We have some work on the northern giant hornet in the lab right now. That's the one that was found in Nanaimo, Canada and Washington State. So we're doing some of the genetics on that to try and find out where it came from, how likely it is to persist. So we're doing some some genetic work with the northern giant hornet. We also have some work with some uh, Argentine ants, another invasive species, where we're looking at how they determine nest mate identity among each other. So all social insects are able to identify nestmates from non-nestmates. We know a lot about how honeybees do that, less so about other other organisms. So I have one graduate student who's working on Argentine ants, and he's trying to find the the genes and neurons responsible for nestmate recognition. How do the honeybees determine nestmates? Yeah, really good question. So it, it all comes down to smell. When a honeybee is, when, we'll talk about workers, I guess, Primarily, when a worker emerges from her cell, she has 
a scent about her. She picked up from the wax and pollen as she was developing. It's the smell is made up of what we call cuticular hydrocarbons. They're just like little waxy kind of oily molecules that get made by and then picked up by as well the body. So bees are kind of a little little waxy. The, for the first few days of her life, her and all of the bees that emerged at about the same time, they all kind of smell the same. As they begin moving and roaming about the colony, developing, kind of maturing a little bit more, they also pick up additional smells from the colony, either by rubbing up against individuals or just from their own, from the food they're eating and what they're digesting. And after those few days, they smell approximately like every other bee in the colony. It's called a gestalt smell. So workers will essentially detect those waxy, smelly compounds with their antennae. So if you ever see workers, I'm making little antenna with my fingers. I know. But yeah. <laughs> that uh, was very accurate, yeah. by the way. I like <laughs> they they look exactly right. like antennae. Right. So they, they touch their body uh, with antennae and they can detect pretty quickly whether or not a bee is a nest mate or not. Well, this leads to a question we might want to talk about later when we talk about drones, but how is it that the drones are accepted in multiple different hives? Yeah, that's, that's a question others have looked at. And it seems like, it looks like they're probably able to tell a nestmate drone from a non-nestmate drone based on one study, but they, can't, they almost just don't care. And the, the reason they don't care, at least that we're going to call this a just-so story because no one's actually tested this rigorously, but the, the just-so story, the reason that we think this is the case is that colonies don't necessarily, wild colonies, you know, in their, in their kind of wild landscape, don't really care so much if a foreign drone enters because it's, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to alert its nest or, pardon me, its colony that there's food resources elsewhere. It's not going to do anything necessarily bad. And it's also incredibly rare for a drone to drift to an, another colony in the wild. You know, they're separated by quite a long distance in the wild. So the pressure for a worker to tell a drone from a, or to tell a nestmate drone from a non-nestmate drone is pretty low, like the evolutionary pressure versus a worker if a worker from another colony finds your colony, that can lead to robbing. So there's pretty strong evolutionary pressure for them to be able to detect nestmate from non-nestmate. Again, all of that is a little hand wavy just so it makes sense, but no one's ever tested it. It'd be kind of a hard thing, I think, to test, but it would be fun to do. Yeah, so that's, that's essentially, essentially it. You're showing us your evolutionary biologist muscles <laughs> with that answer, though. So thank you. Right. <laughs> We tell beekeepers that they those drones drift as long as the nectar flow is on. And as soon as they decide that they're going to not allow their own drones in, then they start to discriminate. Right. So a lot, of, a lot of the decision on the colony for drones comes down to resource availability. Drones will be evicted when resources are, are low. And that's, you know, you tend to see that obviously in the fall, at least the fall here in Indiana. But yeah, resource scarcity will will tend to push drones out. And if those drones can find another colony that accepts them, they'll they'll go there. Drones get kicked out because of resource availability. The ones that if you have if you're a bee breeder out there and you mark your drones in different colonies, you might notice that they just tend to drift if you have colonies of high density anyway. The stat that I quite like is in any given colony during peak drone season, 50% of the drones inside won't be from that colony. In, in like a typical apiary operation, yeah. Okay, there are a lot of jokes we could we could just go with right now <laughs> if we wanted to. Thank you. And on that note, let's take a quick break and hear from our friends at Better Bee. Now that your bees are cozy for the winter, let's turn up the heat with Better Bee's mind-blowing classes. Led by the brilliant Dr. David Peck and the fantastic EAS Master Beekeeper Ann Fry. These classes cover everything from beekeeping basics to advanced winter wisdom. Whether you're a winter beekeeping beginner or a seasoned pro in the apiary, our classes cover everything from snowy basics to advanced insights for winter beekeeping. Head over to betterbee.com forward slash classes and unlock the secrets to upping your beekeeping game. Because at Better Bee, we're all about keeping you warm with knowledge all winter long. Brock, I know one person in your lab, a recent graduate, Garrett Slater, who's been working on drones, but you mentioned that you have five different drone projects going on in your lab right now. 
Can you name them all yeah. in five minutes? No, I'm kidding about that. <laughs> but but could you share uh, with the listeners what you're doing with drones? Because I think they're going to be excited to hear. Yeah, yeah. Garrett kicked off a lot of the work on drones in the lab before he finished up is, and is now a successful postdoc with the USDA. But we've continued some of it and elaborated on on it a little bit. So we have, I think it's about five projects on on drone, general drone biology right now. Drones are understudied. And that's that's just because of, of really what scientists in my field have been interested in with honeybees. They're interested in you know, the, the workings of this society that is mostly made up of, of workers. And all the fun behaviors, of course, are done by workers. And the fun differentiation of sexes between queen and worker is pretty fascinating to biologists. So drones haven't really been looked at a lot. And I think, I think that's too bad. <laughs> I think there's a lot of fascinating biology there. So a lot of our work focusing on drones is trying to understand variants in, in their traits across populations. So we look at things like what makes different populations of drones produce more or less sperm, what causes different colors on their body, or, or actually we have a fun project on eye coloration right now, and what makes drones different from, from workers. So I, the, the, the kind of the projects that I'm excited about all the projects, but the ones that have been really fun recently to work on, one by my graduate student, Jonathan Nixon, has been looking at drone food. So you'd think we'd know what drones eat, but we, we don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's like, interesting because like, all the beginning beekeeping courses all say, well, the workers feed them a honey mixture. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, That's and, it. and it's probably, <laughs> uh, you know, it's Period. probably very similar to what workers get, but we, we don't, we don't really, uh, and when I say eat, I mean as larva, right? I was going to say larvae yeah. or adult. Okay. Yeah. So as larva, they are fed, they're provisioned by workers. You've, you've all seen this if you've opened up a colony and peeked into drone frame, into your drone frames. But we don't actually know the composition of that food. We don't know how different it is from, from workers. And we think that it should probably be different. Drones take longer to develop. There's a few extra developmental days. And a few of those days, especially about like day five, they're producing sperm, and sperm is really expensive to make. I hope I can I can say sperm on here. You said Disney, and I'm sure Disney would have a <laughs> sperm movie, so we're good to say that. <laughs> but <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, we're no, keeping you're that, that in. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so on on about day five, I'll cut back. So on day five, that's when they're making sperm. And they only do it once in their entire lifespan. That is it. They get one shot at making it. So it's pretty important for them at that point to probably have a lot of protein in their diet and to, to probably be developmentally stable, right? The workers are probably going to make sure that, that they're not experiencing any neglect during that pretty critical time period. You said day five. Is that day five as a larva or day five as a larva? Adult? Larva. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just before they pupate, like just before they get the, the cap on top. So what Jonathan has done, and I should actually add, the food itself, we know there's probably honey in there. We know there's pollen in there. At least by eye, you can see that as drones are fed progressively, it just gets more and more rich with pollen. And we know there's royal gel, but we don't really know chemical compound, we don't, uh, chemical identities. We don't know amounts. So my graduate student, oh, I missed one other thing too. There's also bacteria and fungi and yeasts and all kinds of other fun little microbiome components in there. So my graduate student, Jonathan, he set up colonies that made drones and workers at the same time. He collected the food that they were eating every day from, from egg until just before pupation. And he collected the larva. What we're doing with that is just trying to use, we're using a few different techniques to compare drone to worker and then compare day to day. We're using NMR, if you're familiar with that kind of technology. Anyone who's watched, oh, it's my favorite crime show now. If you've watched NCIS, you've seen them use an NMR. And I can tell you it takes a lot longer than a 30-minute episode. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're effectively looking at those traces that you get from NMR and trying to figure out what chemical compounds differ between the two and how they change through time. We are also doing some microbiome work to see how that changes through time. And we collected the larva so that we can look at how physiologically the larva change every day. And we're hoping to link all of those three things up. The goal is really just general bio, uh, basic biology to understand what the difference is. But some of the applications include finally having like an in vitro diet that works for drones. If a beekeeper has done this, please email me. I doubt you have, but I would love to know. If you have fed workers in vitro, like in a little incubator, there's a diet, a standard diet that one can feed workers. 
There isn't one for drones. And if you try feeding the, drone, the, the worker diet to drones, it doesn't tend to work as well. So we'd like to figure out a diet for drones as well. So that project's been super fun. When you say it doesn't work, does that mean there's high mortality or? They don't tend to survive as well as, as they should. Yeah. So you're looking for the key to drone life right now. That's a cool way to put to it. Can you write it? my grant for me? That's a, <laughs> that's a really good one. <laughs> I would suspect that part of this would have to have some impact by Varroa. Yeah, that's right. So we, we would almost certainly predict that, for, well, we know Varroa infestation impacts drone, late, like later in life drone reproductive success sometimes. And once we know the diet and what they're getting, we can start looking a little more deeply about how variation to what they're getting as a result of just feeding or, or what Varroa takes from them via their hemolymph. Once we know a little bit more about what the kind of the basics, then we can begin expanding and asking how variation in those basics impacts reproduction. You know, anything, anything that ha- hits them on that fifth day is probably going to impact sperm in some way, you know, their ability to reproduce. And if the drones are used for the insemination of queens and they're being donating sperm to the insemination process, I mean, that really impacts everything. That's exactly right. Queen failure can occur because of poor mating. If she's mated with the drone that has too little sperm or sperm that is of low quality, her laying success is going to be low and she will likely be turned over. That's a, that's a huge topic in the literature right now. There's some fantastic work on the queen side of this picture, understanding how queens have to store and keep that sperm safe. But we're, we're kind of more interested in the drone side, the one that produces the sperm. So the, the big question for us is, one was just we didn't understand the nutritional differences. Garrett made these wonderful common gardens of these different breeds, and we were able to identify genes and genetic networks that contribute to variation in sperm quality. So we actually know there's a genetic component to this. Different, different breeds like Italian, Carniolan, et cetera, they are different in how much sperm they produce and, how high quali- and the quality of that sperm. So he's, we're hoping to get that published this year. That was a very fun study. So we've got genetic component, we've got nutritional component, and we think together should greatly in, in, enhance our understanding of just basic drone biology. Did he, uh, Garrett also look at the Africanized bee too, honeybee? So we're not allowed to keep or work with that bee here in Indiana. And I didn't, we didn't really want, we didn't really have the resources to go down to Texas and work with it. So we do have a, we did have bees that had scutellata in them, but they weren't the killer bee. It'd be interesting to add that in the mix as well at some point. Yeah, I think places, Texas is a great place to be able to do a study like that, where you have both. You have the, the, you know, the bees from California and the bees, from, well, not <laughs> from California. You have, California is another great place to do it because you have both genotypes, but Texas, California, Arizona, any place where you can work with both would be a great place to do a study like that. Can I ask a really technical question? Yes, please. Worker bee nutrition was well understood, but when you decided to go ahead and develop methods to study the drone nutrition, did you use original methods that were used for the worker information that was gathered? And if so, what iteration of that? Because I know that people have studied nutrition. It it was just early on that people really dug in and studied nutrition. But what version are you using? Is it an updated one? Does that make sense? Because you have to be more sensitive now. Yeah, so we picked NMR because that can give us a, an idea of of kind of all of the chemicals in in the food, and we used some modern microbiomics as well that hasn't really actually been performed on any of the food. I think that's correct. I got to go back and check, but I'm pretty sure that hasn't been performed on worker food. It certainly hasn't been performed on on drone food. So we used the kind of modern techniques that were available to us, and we used we used modern techniques that are available to us, and then we used. Uh, a technique that we can compare across different data sets as well. So we can compare back to some of those older worker data sets. But yeah, as you said, folk, folks have been looking at worker nutrition for, for quite some time and with very different types of tools. There's some very old-ish studies from the 50s and 60s where folks used bomb calorimetry to identify just how many calories are in the food. There's some newer ones where they looked at proportions of protein versus of nitrogen versus carbon 
or protein versus carbohydrate in food. And, and we didn't use those, those techniques because we just had, we had, we had an NMR available to us. <laughs> <laughs> so are you updating the worker nutrition information too at the same time? Yeah, I think we'll be able to update it a little bit, but more we're, we wanted to have the worker component in there as a comparison to the drone. You know, as I mentioned, if you, if you feed, if you use a worker diet on a drone, the success isn't, the, the rearing success isn't usually as high. So we knew that there, or we posited that there's probably a difference in the chemical compositions of the two. So that's, that's why we had worker was just to make that comparison. So you are working with queen breeders? Yeah. So one of the advantages of, of our, of what we do in understanding differences between populations from a genetic perspective is we can apply that to breeding. So I, I was trained in genomics and genetics and genomics has revolutionized animal breeding. Many, many, many thousands. In fact, I think it, if I'm not wrong, I think it's like over a million cows have been genotyped in this country, or at least in the world, I should say. And by having that data, you can begin to predict phenotype, uh, future phenotype. So it's a, it's a way to increase the, I guess, increase our predictions of, of how animals should perform. And it's a way for us to, I guess, gain a, a more deeper understanding of the organisms we're working with. In addition to just phenotypic prediction, you could do some other stuff as well. If, if you know that there are genetic variants that differ between populations, you can use genetics to tell where an unknown sample is from, right? If you, you two send me bees from your yard, I can sequence them and say, well, you know, you shouldn't keep this one. This is from that, that line that we're not allowed to keep in your state. But this one here, this is an Italian, and you probably got it from Georgia, California, or somewhere. <laughs> so we can, we can actually add some information back to, to our breeding efforts. So we do work with bee breeders. We have a project right now with the Indiana Queen Breeders Association, where we are actively using genetic information to predict phenotypes in the next generation. We've sequenced the genomes of, of worker, many, many workers from all of the bees and one beekeepers in, in one of these large breeders' yards. We've tracked them for a season. My, my wonderful graduate student, Dylan Riles, put in just months of effort tracking these colonies and making sure they're queen right and gathering phenotypic data from them. And we have used that along with the pedigrees that the bee breeders had and some genetics to begin predicting phenotypes. So predicting essentially which colonies that that bee breeder should be selecting in the next generation. I love the bringing technology in to support the beekeepers. It's, they've been doing it with their eyes for such a long time. And, so. and what's actually kind of been fun about this project, I mean, other than just the technology use of it is, is how highly correlated our, our estimates are with the beekeepers. <laughs> so we, we have done this, we, we did this in a way in which we gathered all the data and then the beekeeper bee breeder worked with his colonies through the, with their colonies for the whole season. And at the end we said, okay, well, which, which ones would you pick as your top breeders? And, you know, he gave our list, he gave his list, we gave our list and they were, they were very, very similar. The differences are where, where we were interested, but they were very, very, very simple. Are you working on any genetic lines in your lab? Yeah. So we've got the, I inherited the mite biter system from my predecessor, Greg Hunt, and, and Crispin Given uh, is Purdue's senior apicultural specialist. He's still here and he still maintains the line. So we do have the, mite, the Indiana mite biter that we work with here. That is, that is a line of bees that was developed by Crispin and Greg that expresses a, a, expresses a mite resistance trait. The bees, they bite the legs off of varroa mites. It's kind of neat to see. <laughs> uh, we, we, we do um, grooming assays. So you put a sticky bar board in the bottom of the colonies and you pull it out and you look at the varroa mites underneath. You count them and you look at them. And in our mite biters, we see a lot of varroa mites with damage to their body. That's essentially what the phenotype is. So we, we have the mite biter here. It's still going. It's still actively being maintained. And we work with the Indiana Queen Breeders Association to keep that line available to beekeepers. How long does a trait like that stay in a population? I mean, we've had it here for 17 years. But you mean, I guess, is there context to that question? Yes. If I was to buy five of those queens... Only as long as that queen was in my hive, would they exhibit that trait or would her daughter's queens express that trait as well? Based on our look, the daughters would express it too. But the, I guess like the important 
way to look at this is that every generation where you're not maintaining the selective effort, you're going to potentially lose that 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 phenotype. So if if that trait is is not present in your populations at all, and you're not maintaining it, you're not selecting on it, you're not you know keeping that phenotyping up, then eventually you will probably lose it just because of. And if you're not controlling matings in some way, then eventually you might you might lose it. Yeah. So you're asking about lines that we have. So we have that one going. We had one that I, I was very keen on keeping alive, but unfortunately it passed away this season. We had a white eye producing colony. Have you ever seen a white eyed drone? Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it was. Of no use to be. It's absolutely whatsoever. no. It's, it's not at all, but it's, it's very fascinating in terms of, of biology. So we, ever since I started beekeeping and, and way back when I was an undergraduate, I was also doing genetics at the same time. So I thought, well, let's, are there any fun genetics papers on, on honeybees? And there are, there were, there are dozens and there are hundreds. I mean, the, the bee geneticists from the 1920s until the night, really until now have just been really fascinating with what they've been doing. But the early stuff is great because they didn't have genome sequencing. They just only had these mutations that they could look at. So there are just dozens of papers describing various eye and wing and body mutations that, that bee geneticists found. And I thought, uh, I, I grew up in the age of genomics in the post-honeybee genome era. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun one day to try and find the genes for this? I wrote that down actually in a notebook. And so anyway, here I am where I'm a bee geneticist. Uh, <laughs> and, and someone <laughs> emails me, a beekeeper emails me and says, I have a colony producing white-eyed drones. And I said, I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> So we we had yeah we had one going we did many many studies on that that colony we hoped to keep it going but unfortunately none of our grafts inherited the trait so we we lost it but we were able to we're putting together a study now where we've identified the gene responsible we did some phenotypic work on them as well we actually subjected the drones to different tests to find out if they're blind and what what they see what they don't see the morphology of their eye we, we did quite a lot of, of work to try and figure out what this, what this mutation does. And it wasn't just our lab. It was a collaborative effort from many of the bee scientists across the country and even in Canada. Because everyone I emailed when I said I have a white-eyed drone had the same reaction that you had, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like, of course, yeah, I want to work on that. <laughs> so yeah, we have a pretty fun study coming out uh, so this cool. year as well. When you moved from Canada beekeeping to the United States beekeeping. Did you see some major differences? I have worked in very different beekeeping environments. So in northern Canada, we had about four months of beekeeping and then eight months keeping our colonies alive through the winter because <laughs> I'm from very far north. Then I moved to Toronto where I didn't own land. So I was doing, I rented. So I was doing like rooftop and condo beekeeping. I had, I had one apartment where I had a balcony that was probably, I don't know, like, it was two feet by six, so 12 foot square. And I had a colony on there while I was living there. My, my neighbors never found out, luckily. So I, I did some urban beekeeping, which is a very, very different thing than most beekeepers are used to. And in Toronto, I should say the environment is, is similar to where I am in Indiana in terms of the seasons that we get. It's a little harder in urban to, to make sure that you're getting consistent nectar flows. But otherwise, like weather-wise, it's very similar. How we handle the colonies is very similar to, to here in Indiana. The scale is different. I mean, I, I went from urban, I wasn't, I was a grad student, so I wasn't a huge beekeeper. But now we have 200 colonies to manage. Luckily, Crispin Given is, our, is here to help with that. Yeah, I guess in terms of management, it hasn't changed a lot. Well, Brock, is there anything that you'd like to talk to us about? Or oh, wow, you want to describe? Flew. Yeah, time. I told you, it's, this is... <laughs> It goes quickly. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I think we covered all of it. I could, there's always more work that we're doing in the lab that I'd love to talk about, but I don't want to take 45 more minutes of your time. So have me back, have my graduate students back. Yeah, I'd like to talk more about the drones at some point because I just, I still think they're understudied and underrepresented in the literature. So we've been having quite a lot of fun working with drones. They're, they're uh, not easy to work with. They're very fragile. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's so much more fascinating biology that we haven't understood yet about or gained an understanding of in, in drones. 
And what we have found so far, we think will empower the beekeeping community, at least a little bit. I mean, I guess if I were to add anything, I've talked about all the genetics that we can do in working with bee breeders. We do offer genome sequencing services to beekeepers. So if you are interested, not to you, like I won't sequence your genome, but I'll sequence your bees' genomes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's relatively inexpensive. It's eighty five dollars a sample, and we sequence it and we tell you where your sample, where your bee came from, and then your sample gets added to our our database that is ever growing across the country. I think we've got over two thousand samples now. So if you're curious to know where your bees are from, whether they're Italian or Carniol, uh, Italian Carniolan, Russian, etc., we can tell you that if you're interested. But that's it. Uh, if you type in Purdue Purdue honeybee genome sequencing, you'll find it. And is there a map available with the results? Yeah, so there will be. We're putting together a map of, of the overall results for publication. Right now, we have, yeah, we, we've hit pretty much every state. We're still a little low in Nevada, Idaho. Could use some more from Louisiana. But honestly, we'll take samples from, from, from anywhere at this point. Very cool. Well, Brock, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show and look forward to having you back on a regular basis. <laughs> sure thing, yeah be great. Thank you, Brock. Take care. Brock was a, more entertaining than I had even hoped. I knew he was fun just based on our correspondence, but it was enjoyable to have him on the show. He just delivered. I, I think that when a guest, you can't wait to have them back, which is honestly a lot of our guests. I, I think that's just such a treat. And he's doing great things and he's going to do more. So he's just at the beginning of his career. It's impressive. Go out to this website and we'll put the, the link in the show notes to look at the work they're working on at the Harper B Lab. Not to keep stating this, but the, the work they're doing on drones, just not seeing it anywhere else. And so I, I find that fascinating. I had never even considered, this is why I'm doing a podcast, not running a B Lab, but I had never considered that workers are feeding the drones a different food than everything else. I mean, everything we've always learned is that, well, you know, basically the, the workers feed the drones and they grow up to be males and blah, 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 and that's it. And it's uh, interesting. It reminds me a little bit of, of Sammy Ramsey when, in his pursuit of his PhD, where he was answering a question that hadn't officially been asked before as far as what Varroa are feeding on. It seems like Brock has a really just comprehensive line of research projects that are going to give you that information that you want to hear about drones. So only interesting things are going to come out of this work. I agree. I look forward to having him back. Absolutely. Let's get him booked. And that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to follow us and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Better Bee, Global Patty, Strong Microbials, and Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at the Leave a Comments section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>